The Clyde Joint Venture Group consists of two partners. Ham, part of the HBG Group from Ryswijk in the Netherlands, a world leader in dredging. And Fletcher, the civil engineering division of Fletcher Construction, the largest construction company in New Zealand. Their task was to deepen the 125 kilometre long section of river between Clyde and Alexandra, so as to fully utilise the hydroelectric potential of the Clutha River. Mobilisation of staff and equipment began in August 1991. New Zealand is situated in the South Pacific Ocean and lies to the east of Australia. The country has a population of 3.4 million people and enjoys a temperate climate. The high mountains of the South Island attract many visitors and Queenstown is a popular destination for tourists. The mountains also attract a substantial rainfall and there are a number of lakes in the area. The vintage steamship Earnslaw plies Lake Wakatipu, the South Island's largest lake. The New Zealand invention, the jet boat, is quite at home on the rivers that drain water from the lakes district. The Kaurau is one of those rivers. It descends over 300 metres during its journey to the Pacific Ocean, 200 kilometres to the east. Rafting on its white water is quite an experience. The gold prospectors who came in the 1800s utilised that water too. The land was rich in gold and many fortunes were won. Dredges were soon on the scene, some earning their cost having only worked their own length. Nearly 200 dredges dug and scooped their way along the Clutha and Kawarau rivers. The miners' ingenuity even extended to the submarine dredge, designed to scoop the valuable metals from the riverbed. Unfortunately, it sunk on its maiden voyage. After the gold had been worked out, the settlers turned to irrigating the land. Orcharding and farming became the new wealth of central Otago. Fruit growing, particularly, was very successful. On the bank of the Clutha River, the settlement of Dunstan sprang up. It later became known as Clyde and still retains much of the charm of yesteryear. The population of 800 shares its history with the ghosts of those early miners that still haunt the stone and clay buildings that are so much central Otago. The pace of life is pleasant here. With the progress of time, there came the need for electricity. In 1977, work commenced on the construction of New Zealand's largest concrete gravity dam at a site just upstream of Clyde. By February 1992, the training of personnel was commenced and three months later, work was underway on deepening the 12.5 kilometre section of the Clutha River between Clyde and Alexandra. Radio Central, very good morning to you all. And uh, of course it's shaping up to be another great day here in central Otago. Hoping to reach that whopping high of 30 degrees. Saying a big hello to all the guys working hard at the barges and Fletcher Ham. I hope your morning's going well for you. Radio Central, where you. The project manager is Andre Vagnel. He was asked what was the biggest challenge. Well, from the contractor's point of view, the biggest challenge was that the work of this sort was never undertaken in New Zealand. Clutha River is the produces more water than any other river in, in New Zealand, and it is very fast river. The biggest challenge then was to design the equipment that would that would be able to work in the velocities such as a uh, Clutha River can produce and the fluctuation in the flows such as Clutha can produce. Indeed, the river flow velocity has been up to seven knots near the dam, requiring skillful operation of the barges and their pushes. It's expected to drop to one knot once the river level has been lowered. Reference points located at the Clyde Dam are used to orientate the exact location of the drilling rig to within 200 millimetres. Upstream of the Clyde Bridge, a one kilometre section of the river required underwater blasting to remove the bedrock of central Otago schist. In all, 130,000 cubic metres of material is to be removed. 
This contract has been sublet to Adkins Blasting Services of Auckland. Seismograph equipment is set up at two locations in Clyde prior to blasting. Vibration and noise levels are monitored to ensure that the strict limitations which have been imposed under the contract are adhered to. The drilling barge has two drilling towers, each fitted with a hydraulic hammer drill which is capable of moving along a set of rails. A paddock of up to 54 blast holes can be drilled at a time. A protective casing shrouds the drill as it's lowered into the fast flowing river and penetrates the overburden. Once bedrock is reached, drilling begins. Because of the close proximity of Clyde Township, Dunstan Hospital and other private residences, there are very strict noise limitations on this drilling operation. Blasting is restricted to the hours between 7am and 7pm on weekdays only. On completion of drilling the paddock, the fuses are attached to delay detonators and to a firing cable. A three minute warning is given to residents in Clyde Township prior to each blast. The drilling platform is then manoeuvred by winch ropes clear of the blast area. In recognition of the presence of historical buildings nearby, vibration caused by this blasting is closely monitored. The monitoring seismographs are triggered manually shortly before the blast. This ensures they're not prematurely set off by ambient sound. And the following the detonation of the charges, the all clear is sounded and the firing cables retrieved. The measure of vibration is particle velocity and internationally recognized is a maximum limit of 50 millimeters per second. For this contract, but 10% of that allowable level is permitted. The removal of 2.8 million cubic meters of material from the riverbed is a huge undertaking. The partners assemble the workforce of 100 people for the task. Precise data on the depth of the river and accurate positioning was considered essential for the success of the project. A team of surveyors using the latest in survey equipment was charged with providing this information. A ring of reflecting prisms mounted on the jet boat reflect back beams transmitted from the self-tracking geodometer on shore. That information enables continuous calculations of the boat's position and is then sent back to the computer on board the boat by telemetry. A depth finder scans the riverbed below and feeds information directly to the onboard computer. Surveyor Gary Healy keys in other information and a picture of the riverbed and the XY coordinates is built up. All this information is stored on disk for later analysis. Using a number of fixed shore stations, a contour model of the entire riverbed is pieced together and progress on dredging or movement of the riverbed sediment can be assessed. The stored information is retrieved back at base, processed, then fed to a plotter that prints out a contour plan of the riverbed. An accurate picture is soon available and decisions based on this information can be confidently made. The onshore survey equipment also feeds information to the digger barges. The computer interrogates the incoming telemetry to give a precise location. This enables the digger operator to manoeuvre the barge to the desired position. Two of these 500 ton digging pontoons are being used on the river. Each is equipped with a hydraulic digger that has a bucket capacity of over 5 cubic metres. They can work to a depth of 12.5 metres. Willem Schultz is the ham representative on the job. It's his okay, responsibility as to where and when to dig. The type of material is actually uh, far ranging. It, uh, cha it changes from up the dam from uh, large, very large boulders up to very fine silt more downstream. And in between we have shot rock, we have gravels and the unexpected clay but the range is from very hard to very sloppy. The channel excavation has been designed to remain entirely within the existing natural river banks. A minimum of 60 metres width and at least one metre of depth is required by the conditions of the water rights. 
A visual display screen is fitted in the cab of the excavator. It enables the operator to monitor the position of the bucket and to ensure that the desired depth is not exceeded. It takes about three quarters of an hour to load the 500 tonnes of riverbed material onto the barge. To ensure stability during digging, spuds, which are large steel legs, are lowered to the riverbed and the entire platform is jacked up. A changeover of the crew takes place early each afternoon. The initial contract allowed for a seven-day, 24-hour operation and three teams working around the clock was envisaged. But after the Resource Management Act came into force, the permitted hours of work were reduced to 16 a day. The walking system of the digging barge is by way of tumble spud. The trailing spud is able to be inclined up to 15 degrees, allowing considerable movement. In association with the extendable bucket arm of the digger, the vessel can be manoeuvred. Once in position, the entire barge is made secure with the extension of the other two spuds. We have to extreme to extremes to protect the uh, purity of the water. Uh, we have we are probably the first people in New Zealand that are using biode biodegradable oils in our equipment, so that in case of a spill in the river, we do not damage the uh, we don't damage the river. That's at, I might say at a great cost. Occasionally, riverbed mud is brought to the surface and crew members are mindful of the gold-bearing history of this river. While most of the section has already been worked over by the earlier dredges, a little panning during spare time can bring rewards. The task of transporting the riverbed materials from the digger barges to the dispersal area falls to the pusher crews and their barges. These barges are 48 metres long and 10 metres wide capable of carrying some 300 cubic metres of spoil, six of these steel barges are shuttled about the river by three powerful pusher boats. They're powered by two 350 horsepower motors, driving separate propulsion units that can be rotated 360 degrees. A trip up the river from the disposal area to the vicinity of the Clyde Bridge initially took about an hour and a half the return trip only 15 minutes. As the river level decreases and the current abates, so too will the duration of the passage. As a full barge becomes available, one of the pushers makes fast in preparation for the downstream journey. The combination is then released from the digger barge, often with a friendly nudge from the excavator to help it on its way. We've advertised for tug masters and they, in most cases, came from the fishing industry. Fishermen that from Bluff, Dunedin, Timaru, other parts of New Zealand. Uh, and those people adapted very well. I take some people days uh, to be trained, some people maybe a month. But they all trained very well and we've got a very, very good crew here now. There's often a variation in the water flow level of the Clutha River. The Clyde Dam now controls this flow, and staff at the powerhouse are in constant contact with the waterborne craft downstream by way of radio telephone. Yeah, Roger, we're about to start our increase to 780 cubics. Okay. The unloading area is about halfway down the section of the river that's being deepened. A wharf of sheet piling has been constructed with a tubular piling jetty alongside. It's to be removed on completion of the contract. This spoil dump area is adjacent to the old McPherson Road aggregate pit that was used during the construction of the Clyde Dam. Two 50-ton hydraulic diggers are used to unload the barges. They place the material in a grizzly, a mechanical vibrating sieve that separates the larger rocks over 75 millimetres in diameter. It's intended to use them to armour the channel banks at a later date. There's strict monitoring of the noise generated on site, and suppression equipment is installed where at all feasible. 
From a common hopper which is used to control distribution, the waste material is whisked away.